seem to be here. Uh, someone asked this morning if I was excited, and I don't know if I'm shaking up here because I'm cold from walking over here, or, or if it's just that I'm that excited about taking a class. I don't think that uh, I ever filled in for this class even in the last couple of years. I've been able to fill in for life and teachings and Old Testament survey. I never filled in for fundamentals. I know this one I think. I filled in for minor prophets, so uh, I get to teach that second semester, so I feel like I've got a little hand up on at least a couple of sections on that. And looking forward to teaching it, but uh, very much looking forward to teaching this class. Um, sorry that Dr. Ward had to go for me to get the opportunity to teach it, but nonetheless, happy to be able to teach the class. I've been asked as far as the uh, the papers and when they're due and if there are going to be any changes to the end of the semester. I was talking to Dr. Ward the other day at lunch, and uh, he was talking about how much material we had left to cover and how many days we had. He said we had eight. We discussed a little bit further and decided we had six. Uh, then, of course, the uh, final exam uh, in the last week of school. So, uh, we will leave things as he has set them up as far as papers being due. Uh, perhaps one minor change is through the book of books of John. We will not have the papers due until the very end of Third John, and uh, those can all be done as one paper as opposed to three separate papers. Uh, because by that time we may be very quickly covering Second, Third John, and the Book of Jude, and any other last-minute questions. But anyway, we only have six class period, so we're going to have to cover quite a bit of ground. We are in Second Peter, I understand, about verse 11. Just by way of a background, again, to the book of Peter, we find chapter 1, which is making sure our calling. I think very important for all of us who have been reared in the church. How many of you have spent uh, most of your life in the church? There are very few that haven't. Uh, my folks came in the church when I was five years old. And I started attending there in the library building in Pasadena uh, when Mr. Armstrong was doing almost all the preaching. There were a few others, Dr. Hayes and a few, uh, Dr. Meredith, a few that would occasionally give sermons, but Mr. Armstrong was giving the sermons. Not that I heard that much of them because, again, I was five years old. And uh, growing up in uh, grade school and junior high and high school, uh, it wasn't until high school that I really started paying a whole lot of attention. And even then, I suppose, not as much attention as I should have. But I think it's particularly important with this particular book, this particular chapter, as far as making sure our calling. Um, the second chapter we'll see is talking about avoiding Gnosticism. And really, I think he's talking about having true faith in the face of false teachers. That has been one of the difficulties in the last 10 or 15 years, even within God's church is that there were some within the church who then became false teachers. Particularly difficult in 1978, 79, and 80, I was pastoring a church in uh, Kansas City in the Midwest. During the time of 1979, 1980, when there were quite a few within the ministry that left. You can go back about five or six years earlier than that, 1974. At that point, I was teaching at Imperial. I went out into the field in 74, but uh, 73, 74 was another very serious time in the work where there were several, particularly on the East Coast, that quit the work. And unfortunately, for many of those ministers leaving the work, they were in the process of trying to take certain individuals from the church with them. Some of them trying to set up their own congregations, uh, of course, to get the tithes, and that will tie into some of the things that we'll read in the course of Second Peter. So we find that Peter was facing similar problems. It was quite some time after the death of Christ. There were many that had grown up in the church uh, as a result of their parents having been called at the time of Christ's death uh, and uh, resurrection. You read of the uh, thousands that were added to the church in the book of Acts, early in the book of Acts. So that would have been about 31 A.D. You go 30, 35 years to the point that Peter is writing. There have been several martyrdoms that have taken place. Uh, many years have gone by and we come to a point that many in the church felt that Christ would not return. My Lord delays his coming. Was the attitude extant among many of those in the church? I have seen that as an attitude within God's church here of the last few years. Particularly because sometimes as human beings we set certain, certain things in our mind, certain dates in mind, that things have to happen by a certain time. When I grew up in the church 
feeling like 1972 was the time we fled, 1975 was the return of Christ. And, you know, it wasn't written in stone, it wasn't a doctrine of the Worldwide Church of God, however it was taught. By many ministers it was felt, uh, I took classes in which, uh, when I came to college in 1966, I think it was that year, it would be 66 or 67, in which, in the process of looking at prophecy, we looked at all the prophecies that we thought had to do with the return of Christ, Look at the enumeration from creation to that time and how this would tie in and time cycles and all these things. We put that all together and my wife has in the back of her Bible still a time chart. It has dates, it has day of the month, that this and that will probably happen. Not doctrine again, but probably. Well, the closer we got to those dates, the more it became possibly to the point that then all of a sudden in 1969, Dr. Meredith sent letters out to the field of reminding the men of how many things had yet to take place, the unification of the Catholic Church, unification of Europe, the uh, combination then of Catholicism with, with Europe, and many other things that need to take place, and that we better remind the people that we are not looking at a specific date for things to happen. We are looking overall for righteousness, for obeying God, and then when, when God is ready to send Christ, to return, then we better be ready. The similar problem that we have here in the book of uh, Second Peter, that so much time had transpired. They thought Christ is returning within just a few years of his death and going up to the Father to, to prepare places, and, and uh, even Paul thought that it would be in his lifetime. You read Second Timothy and get to the end of his life, which is just a few years, apparently earlier than this right of here. And at that particular point, he realizes that it wasn't going to be in his lifetime. As Mr. Armstrong finally came to realize, uh, right at the end, that it wasn't going to be in his lifetime. I mean, we all hold out the hope. Mr. So Merrill held out the hope. I went to school with, uh, with Wayne. And, uh, you know, we all thought, when we went to college, we were sure that by now, uh, we would be spirit beings, that the millennium would be here. We see through a glass darkly, don't we? God gave us as much material information as we need so that we can be prepared, so we can be equipped to be there. And this is what he's talking about in Second Peter. So, uh, you've been through the first few verses of verse 4 of chapter 1, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So that is the whole purpose of the book, is that we can be partakers of the divine nature we are through the Holy Spirit, uh, and that we will be eventually, as we actually become God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. One of the main points he does bring out through here is how much lust has to do with the effects on the world, that it is Satan's world, that we have to come out of Satan's world, and the corruption that is therein. And there was corruption brought into the church as a result of the false teachers, false prophets, that were coming in and they were more concerned with how much money they were making, as we'll see as we uh, see some of their character flaws. We see then verses 5 through 8, the things that we're to be growing in. It is easy growing up in the church to come to the first three or four levels, to a degree. I'm not talking about the depth that we need to have on them, but a superficial, perfect understanding of what God's knowledge is. For instance, the first one is faith, a certain faith that Christ lived and died, that he was resurrected, and that is, for some, a fairly easy to come by. They see that, they understand that. Now, for others, they totally deny that, and there were teachers here that were denying that Christ would even come. Of course, this is the aspect of Gnosticism. They believe that Christ would have nothing to do with anything physical, because physical is evil. Therefore, how could he even uh, be touched by a sinner who comes in and washes his feet? So, they were, they were thinking that Christ was just a phantom, uh, that... Uh, he was not the creator that he created an angel, he created another angel, created another angel, and down we get through the course of time, but then finally uh, an angel then created the earth. So he talks about these eight elements that we are to have, that you, you have faith, and we're growing deeper in faith, I think some of this is circular, uh, though it starts with faith, we added that virtue, the moral excellence, the realization that we had better live up to a certain standard, and then of course we grow in understanding what that standard is, we grow at the same time, then we add to that knowledge, the gnosis, the proper knowledge of God. It's easy 
for some to come to that aspect a little bit earlier uh, than uh, many of these other attributes. Because there's certain knowledge, I think, that most of you, I was talking in uh, Freshman Bible about this here a couple of weeks ago, so, uh, we were going through the uh, parable of the sower. Now, some people, they just go through the, the steps, you know, the one that where the seed is thrown on the rocky soil, and they don't work to get really the depth of the root system and the foundation, but there's a surface understanding and there's a surface rooting that takes place, so they're fine until tribulation comes. The difficulty is hit that it says the sun comes and then it withers up. Well, the tribulation that then hits some that they've grown up around the church. They've been good, quote, worldwide church of God, and quote, citizen, members. But until the tribulation hit, difficulties hit, which we found in 74, we found particularly in 1979, 1980, where some were taking pot shots at Mr. Armstrong at the leadership of the church. Uh, some who had been in leadership wanted to take leadership back over within the church. And that was the real reason why they had filed a lawsuit uh, to try to get control of the church. At that particular time, uh, we, we faced some of those difficulties. There is the, uh, the tribulations that then hit that try a man's depth of rooting. I mean, how deep you have your root is how low you can, can get that root system when you're being dried up, when your spirit is being dried up because of the trials, the difficulties. Uh, it can be financial, it can be physical, it can be the health problems that you have. It can be the fact that you see others promoted, uh, others advanced, and you feel you should have the same opportunity. Why don't I have that? Uh, in some situations, because you're not ready for it. And in other situations, it may be because you were overlooked. That has happened. How do you function during those times. If your roots are deep enough, then no matter how dry the environment gets, your system, root system, gets down to where you have the water table, even as the water table gets lower and lower. But you still have roots that go down that pull from the Holy Spirit. Water is the type of the Holy Spirit. But you can pull from that that you maintain the fruit and that you develop. Well, there were many within the church at that particular point but it was obvious that they had a basic system of knowledge. I mean, they basically understood the truth and where they stood that, well, this is the church and, you know, this is a, supposed to be the way to live. And they had a surface knowledge, but they hadn't gone the steps beyond this basic knowledge. And in the Session Bible, I was talking about how the... For instance, if, if one of us were to marry a Catholic, Catholics don't believe in marrying outside their church. So therefore, you could go and you can sit in catechism for six weeks. And you can then pass the test at the end of that catechism class and you can become a Catholic. And then you marry. And then the true test is, are they really a Catholic? Are they really become a Catholic? And it's funny, because there's one couple that's in the class there that I noticed when I said it, they just started laughing and laughing. I, I, I couldn't think of anything I'd said wrong at that time because your mind, you know, the recording comes back, okay, what did I say wrong? What, what words did I misuse? And then afterwards, I, I asked him, and, and uh, knowing them as well as I do, I figured it had something to do with the aspect of the Catholic. And he had done that. He had gone, and he became a Catholic so that he could marry uh, Mrs. Connors. <laughs> and uh, in turn, uh, that was the last time he ever went to church, by the way, it was uh, for, the, uh, for the wedding. I think the same thing happens within the Worldwide Church of God. I know it happens within the Worldwide Church of God. Because some that, uh, we call it proselyzing dating, that has happened in the past, particularly at the point uh, that there were some difficulties in the last, oh, five, ten years within the church, or a certain looseness as far as who we might marry, and uh, certain marriages outside the church were allowed for a certain period of time, which I think that has been uh, pretty much uh, taken care of now. But during that time period, there were there were quite a few that they would come and they would kind of attend church for a while, and, and they would say, "Oh well, I really believe this." They get married, and then sometimes you never saw them again. Uh, there are others that have just stuck stuck around, and this is something for all of us to think about, having grown up in the church: is how deep is your root system? How deep does your knowledge go? Have you added to knowledge temperance, the self-control, added to that the patience, the steadfastness, the courage to carry on? in spite of the difficulties that we might have, in spite of what others say about us. Which, uh, again, back in 7980, there were many family members who left the church that were then taking pot shots at those who stayed, 
I talked about the Mr. Armstrong, the way the money was spent, uh, the teachings in the past, the, the mistakes that we made, and, you know, I don't think there's any sense in, in denying the fact that there were some that very strongly taught certain aspects of prophecy that were not, were not right. As far as the time sequence and whatever, we came to see that. You know, we, we change, we grow. And uh, hopefully we'll come to see that, that we don't want to set those dates. We then find the other problem where then some people feel like, well, it's going to go on indefinitely. It's the same problem they face during the time of Peter. And then we add to that the godliness, uh, the reverence of God, the right attitude towards God. Add to that then the action, the true faith in God, which is the brotherly kindness, the philanthropy, uh, philanthropia, the love of brotherhood, concern for one another, which we will see in the book of John, First John, uh, the uh, need for brotherhood, loving your brother is a sign of whether you love God. And then, of course, the eighth, which is charity, agape, which is spiritual love, the depth of love that we have to have and that we better be examining ourselves uh, while times are basically good, as they are in the church now, before uh, times do get rougher. Uh, do we have that brotherly love concerning one for another, uh, that we're not going to be fighting one against another? Or do we have the agape love that we're growing? So we see then in verse 10, Wherefore, the, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Jude, verse 24, talks about falling away. There is a certain correlation between the book of Jude and Second Peter, especially Second Peter chapter 2, you will find there are many that feel that uh, that was the source that Jude used then to just reiterate and to reemphasize some of the points that he makes. Um, but verse 24 of Jude, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God provides your divine help. If your root system is deep enough, that it is uh, deep into the Holy Spirit, that your prayers, it's a lifeline, uh, the ability to use the Son, uh, with the analogy of the soul and, and the seed, uh, if, if we are close enough to God. Verse 11, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. One of the responsibilities of the ministry is to remind. You have the opportunity to teach and to preach. Sometimes it can be a difficulty because they think, well, oh, we've already said that before. That's been, that's been covered. Why should I then go through that again? I want to do something new. Well, we are responsible to bring ourselves into remembrance of the things that we've been taught. How to live. Uh, go back to Matthew 5 through 7. Uh, to be the core, the basis of what we believe and, and how we live. And I'm sure there are many aspects there that we still need to grow in and, and to understand. Therefore, I will not always be negligent, or I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. You must work diligently to be established in the present truth so that you can remain in the future truth, when difficulties, when trials come along. Now he's concerned because he knows that he's not too far from death. It had been prophesied how he was to die, and uh, Peter wanted to remind them that in spite of what difficulties came, in spite of the death of Wayne Merrill, in spite of what other deaths will take place in the future in the worldwide church of God, that should not alter anybody's faith at all. Faith is knowing and doing what's right. It's believing in the truth, understanding how God wants us to live, and then taking that step, walking in faith, obeying God. So we are to remain in the present truth, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. As long as I am in this physical tent, the word is skenoma, S-K-E-N-O-M-A. It means body in this tent. Second Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8, shows that this is a temporary life. It is so easy, isn't it, to get involved with the materialistic and how much money one has and um, or doesn't have with the stock market crashes a few weeks ago. 
Uh, and all those difficulties. It doesn't mean that we don't prepare, we don't take care of our families and do those things. We do have that responsibility to take care of. But we don't get overly consumed with that. Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through the end of the chapter. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Well, Christ is saying that you've got enough problems today as far as facing in your life and overcoming in the present truth. You've got enough to overcome without worrying about what's going to take place next week, next month. Again, he is not talking about financial planning and preparation. First Timothy 5, verse 8. He that does not take care of his family, take care of his own, it says, is worse than an infidel. Worse than somebody who then leaves the church. This is something that we emphasize periodically even within the church to remind those that, you know, just because you sit in a congregation, just because you come to church week in and week out, if you're not living up to responsibilities, then are you a member of God's family? And God's the one that determines that. He sees the heart, he sees what we're doing, and then we have to evaluate how we're living up to that. So he's saying that uh, the temporary life of Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, uh, that's temporary. It's great to go out and have a good time. It's great to play sports, to be involved in music and, and those things. As long as character is being built, character is being developed in our lives. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that we have to have a Bible study every time we have a party. Okay? Uh, but we can have good, clean, fun, and fellowship and uh, be growing in that sense. Uh, but the temporary life is nothing compared to the spiritual. The spiritual is that that lasts forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The whole book of Ecclesiastes, frankly, is about that thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that uh, we know that it is what God does that lasts forever. The physical, the temporary, is here for temporary enjoyment. We have pets, for instance, because there is a certain temporary enjoyment. In spite of what some people think, or what some kids think, that because they want to resurrect Fido, uh, because that was their pet, and they can't imagine living forever without Fido. Well, I'm not a dog lover, so I can imagine it. Easy. I and mean, we've got a dog, but when I put up with him. Uh, now, I do know the parrots will all be resurrected. That, there's no question about that. Uh, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. The word put off is metaphorical for disrobing. He's saying, just like I might take off my coat, I have to take off this physical life. Now, this led the Gnostics to believe, and uh, many of them thought that the body was evil and physical, and of course there was a duality that then the spirit would then live forever, and, and we have to kind of fight through this world, but then when we can finally get rid of this physical body, then we immediately become God. We know there are other places that show that that's not true, and that's not what Peter is saying. In fact, Peter is letting them know that when he dies, uh, they better continue on steadfast with what they believe. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me, John chapter 21, verses 18 through 19, so that his death was prophesied. He knew. I mean, can you imagine having preached the number of years that he did, from 31 A.D., the death of Christ, to about 65, 67, whenever this took place? Uh, 35 years uh, knowing that you were going to be martyred. Well, he knew that his time was coming fairly soon. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. The word deceased means exodus. Abel, after my exodus, after I leave this world, to have these things always in remembrance. He knew the need for history. But the purpose of history is to teach us a lesson, help us to keep close to God, help us to not make the same mistakes as we read in 1 Corinthians 10 that they made uh, in the Old Testament, but that we have a... Uh, a constant need for the history to see what has taken place. We have a need for prophecy. 
uh, to see what is to take place in the future. As long as we don't get so tied up in all the finite details of, okay, it's got to happen exactly this way and that way, and that then becomes a doctrine to us. Verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now he focuses a little bit more on the Gnostics, and he's saying that our faith is founded on facts. Faith is the assurance of things not seen, but it is founded on fact. It's founded on the fact that Christ came and lived his life, that he was a God of the Old Testament. We see how he dealt with Israel. We see how he dealt with the New Testament church, how he magnified the law, the spirit of the law. And we can see based upon those facts, the fact of his death and resurrection that took place, we can see how we're supposed to live when we apply ourselves to that. So he's saying that it's based on facts, not on uh, the Gnostic approach that Christ was a phantom in human form, <clears throat> that he was just manifesting himself day in and day out, and he was really God, but he, he was just kind of this phantom that talked to people, and then they were told how to live, and then he left. Um, we know that Paul went into Arabia, and that he was taught for three years. Was it directly by Christ? Did Christ manifest himself to Paul to teach him? We think that that's quite a possibility, the way Paul talks. It's also a possibility that it was through visions of an angel. He doesn't say specifically how it took place. But then they want to apply that to his, to Christ's whole life. Christ did manifest himself in the Old Testament, didn't he? He uh, came down to uh, to Jacob, wrestled with Jacob. On and on you can go with the uh, stories of Gideon and and the one story and another that Christ as a God of the Old Testament did manifest himself. Now, it wasn't a phantom in their concept of being a phantom, but he was really God. He literally manifested himself so that he could talk. He had a meal with Abraham. Uh, but in the New Testament, we know through the Word of God, through uh, the first four books of the Bible, plus the 400 that he appeared to, then after four or 500, I forget the exact number, Acts chapter 1, uh, that he appeared to uh, many, then of course the witnesses that took place for years and years after to Peter and then to the point of 100 A.D. with the book of John that we'll be seeing. That it was a man 100 years old who writes to us because he knew there were certain gaps in the record of the New Testament that needed to be filled. And just before his death then, he closed that gap and then we have the uh, canonization of the New Testament. So he emphasizes really here the eyewitnesses of his majesty. Of, and the word majesty means divine glory. They were there. They were standing there when Christ left and was taken up in the cloud. They were there to see the miracles of Christ appearing and disappearing in front of their eyes after his crucifixion. They were there with him before that to know that he was physical. They knew he was human. They saw him sweat. I mean, here, you know, here were men out hiking and, and going on trips, and there are certain uh, physical aspects of life that uh, they were very aware of. And they're just saying that they know that he lived physically, that he died, that he was resurrected, and that he was at the right hand of God the Father. We, in verse 16, talking of Peter and John, we have not followed as the main leaders then, um, Paul very well may have been dead by now. Uh, James, of course, was dead. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Of course, an angel that was uh, taking the message of God the Father. I know in John chapter 5, John chapter 1, that no man has heard the voice of the Father nor has seen the Father, so it's uh, talking about an angel having said that, but making sure that they knew that this was his son. Here was more evidence. And at this point, he's really showing historical evidence. He gives personal evidence early in the chapter of the feelings. Now, here is the, the spiritual evidence, in a sense, of this is how we're supposed to live our lives, so that we can fight off false teachers and false teachings. He says, now here's the historical evidence. Here's what took place, and uh, this should stand us in good stead. 
as far as fighting false teaching that we know. And it's particularly important that we individually see those things. Uh, I've, I come from a family who grew up in a church. Two of us within, uh, two of the kids are in the church and two aren't. And that comes to a degree. Now, my younger brother was never baptized, never went to Ambassador College, uh, never was really involved in the church in that sense, but he grew up and he went to church the first 18 years of his life, and I, uh, I know that because he lived with us the last year when he was 17, and, uh, because my folks moved out of California, and it was his senior year in high school, so he stayed there, and I was teaching to high school, so, uh, he was there after that year, and I think he probably attended another year or two after that, but, he, they didn't fit. Now, I hope that he comes to his senses before the Great Tribulation, and if he doesn't before then, I hope he does during the Great Tribulation. Uh, because surely the knowledge is there. If we go back to the first part of the chapter, there's an underlying uh, information that he's aware of, and, and my sister went to Ambassador College, probably about as close to a grade A student as ever come out of my family, or will. Uh, well, my daughter, a lot like my sister, I guess. Uh, she brought home a report card yesterday, and I, I was a little upset about math because it was an 89. Now, they have 90 as an A, but there was the only thing under 90 was an 89, so I uh, have to give her something to shoot for, but she knew I was happy. My son's report card comes home today. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing the transformation at that point because uh, Tracy has to rub it in a little bit and uh, anyway it's going to be a good morning and afternoon tonight might not be so quite so good uh, time will tell but uh, we have then the responsibility that we have the in-depth understanding and the knowledge and you have to view yourself individually no longer are you living with parents uh, going back even to the concept of the uh, grade 13 for church kids and going on to college and being involved with it, this is probably the easiest you're going to have it as far as obeying God. You have a peer pressure. You have an environment where people are doing what's right overall. Okay? We're not going to elect any of you to sainthood yet. But overall, people are doing what's right. They have a common goal, a common direction. There may be a few that have no concept whatever of what Ambassador College Worldwide Church of God is about, but I think it's the minority. But overall, it's an environment of doing what's right. It is very important as far as prayer life and, and dedication in, in incorporating scripture into memory and into uh, a walk of life at this point before you then get back out into the environment that you may have come from, uh, basically, work environment, uh, those difficulties that uh, then uh, all of a sudden we are then tested. Well, we have the uh, responsibility of saying here to look at what's happened historically to view uh, then how we are incorporating into our life what has been taught. Uh, verse 18. This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And uh, they heard the voice uh, in uh, Christ's presence. The holy mount is talking about mount, well, the mount of transfiguration. I was going to say Mount Tabor. The Mount of Transfiguration, which many think was Mount Tabor in Galilee. But the Holy Mount, holy because of Christ's presence there. And of course they heard the angel saying, this is my son. And of course, speaking for God the Father. So one more proof. Verse 19, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The day star arise in your hearts. We again view where is our heart focused. He says a light and that is talking about a lamp. As Christ said earlier, a lamp that is set on a hill that shines forth in the darkness that gives off light. And we probably, most of us experienced that, at least in Fatley Row, we did. I, I don't, do have candles in the dorms for the blackouts. Uh, <coughs> anyway, we had candles. We were preparing dinner during the last night. I just knew the lights didn't go out. You know, storm, big sandy, lights go out. Uh, it's not real hard to come up with a uh, 
right decision that. So we made sure we had the fajitas ready to go uh, just in case. And sure enough, just before we sat down to eat, uh, the electricity went out. But I made sure that those tortillas were in the oven. Uh, and even when the electricity went out, that we had gotten the oven good and hot so that we could slip these the tortillas in there. So we had we had a great evening with these candles. It's amazing when the lights all go out, just what one candle will do. Place in the middle of the room and how much light that gives forth. That you do well to take heed as unto a candle, a lamp, uh, as they burn oil in their lamps, that shines in a dark place. You live in a dark place. Not so dark here on campus, we hope, as it will be when you go back to a church area, you go back to work, uh, wherever you work, uh, with the, uh, with the world. And the dark place he's talking about this world spiritually, John chapter 8, John 8 verse 12. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You are to take the light of life, which is Christ in you. So as this candle shines, it's Christ in you that shines in the world. That you are to appear different. Not by your much words as you come into the office in the morning, uh, praising God or whatever, you know, and, and uh, telling people how they ought to live, but the fact that they see you living a life that is a life of faith, that is not a life of fear as so many people live in this world. Uh, they see by your conduct, by your attitude, that you're a positive person, that you have a trust in something that uh, maybe they can't understand, but that you are this lamp in a dark place, the dark place of the world, until the day dawn and the day star, and that is talking about Jesus Christ. Christ is the day star. Um, word is phosphorus, P-H-O-S, P-H-O-R-U-S, that is luminous, it is a morning star. Some uh, verses to tie in with that, Numbers 24, verse 17. Numbers 24, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, and Revelation 2, verse 28. But uh, the day star arises in your hearts. How does it arise in your heart? Well, we know that Christ, in his coming until the day dawn, until the day star, until Christ comes. In that sense, there is an aspect of that. Now, I mean, you think about the tremendous joy there's going to be. As Dr. Maris was talking in the funeral sermon, even uh, with uh, this particular graveside, this uh, cemetery, as well as, is it Mount Pleasant? All right, okay. In uh, Pasadena, that's where uh, Mr. Armstrong is buried, Mrs. Armstrong. I think uh, Dick Armstrong is buried there. And, and many of the members who many years in the church are buried up there where I went to my first funeral uh, in the church. And at that particular point, the joy that there's going to be, and with the resurrection that takes place at the return of Jesus Christ, and uh, as he puts it, uh, the traffic jam that's going to take place, there are going to be so many out of those tombs, those uh, graves at that particular point. But the joy of families being reunited. This life now, with God's Holy Spirit, there is to be an inner joy. There is supposed to be one of the attributes of the Spirit, of course, is joy. Love, joy, peace. That there is an exuberance, even in spite of physical difficulties, of sickness. In spite of the fact, yes, we do mourn. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall inherit the earth, or they shall be comforted. Uh, with Christ's statement. We are to mourn, but there is an underlying joy in every aspect of our lives. And we've got to be able to express that joy, and we ought to show that joy in our lives. That arises in your heart. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is by private interpretation. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 8. A couple of very important verses with this will tie in for prophecy classes that you'll take in the future. And this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, as far as the inspiration of the Bible tie hand in hand with 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The word inspiration there means in breathe the breath of life, so to speak. That God has breathed life into these words. 
And uh, if you can't see that, and there are some, I've had counseling for some, that well, they think the Bible is an interesting piece of literature. And historically it seems to hold up fairly true uh, in their minds. But that's all they see it as. There's a bunch of men that wrote the Bible. Well, a bunch of men did write the Bible. But what was unique about those men was that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That it was the mind of God in their minds, or at least in their pens, at times when they didn't understand. For instance, Daniel didn't understand what he was writing, but he had the Spirit of God to do what God said. And God said, write this. Daniel wrote this. Daniel says, God, what's it mean? God says, Daniel, you don't need to know. It's for those at the time of the end to understand. So he preserved it for us to understand. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. He's talking about familiar spirits in verse 19. Wizards that peep and that mutter should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead. Why should you go to the dead? Why should you go to the spirits of the dead? As Saul went to the spirit of Samuel, who was dead. (coughs) Who was dead. Why should he go to him to find out what was going to happen in the battle? It's interesting that he did get a certain element of truth from the demon that he talked with. That there was going to be the battle and that he and his sons were going to die. The interesting point in working with the demon world and with the spirits, sometimes there's an element of truth. Of course, they're also liars, so you don't know for sure. But even when they tell you the truth, they have no power to change things. Now, what if Saul had gone to God and found out that he was going to die because of his sins and he had turned to God in repentance at that point? Would God perhaps have changed the outcome of the next day. You don't have that same opportunity if you're going to the wrong spirits. He says, you don't look to spirits, verse 20, you look to the law and to the testimony, to the prophets. You look to what's been written to see how you're supposed to live. You can see a testimony of how others lived, how they were treated, You can see the testimony in Hebrews 11 of those who came before us and how we're supposed to live. If they speak not according to the word, it is because there is no light in them. So your test in life is to get to know the Bible well enough that you test everything that's said. Be it in a class, be it in church services, wherever you are, that you are really, you're testing what's said so that you can apply it in your life. There was a time in the church that there were things said from the pulpit that should never have been said, that were not proper doctrine. Some that were teaching uh, a licentiousness that was allowing uh, uh, people whatever avenue, whatever whatever they wanted to do, um, basically a concept of doing away with keeping any of the letter of the law because somehow the spirit of the law did away with any of the letter of the law. Now, I defy you to try to keep the spirit of the law and not keep the physical aspect of the law as far as the Sabbath. How are you going to keep the spirit of the Sabbath and yet you're going to work on Saturday? How are you going to keep the spirit of the law and not committing adultery and yet physically break the law? You can't do it. And yet there were some that, uh, because of the the, uh, things they were teaching, there were people that were getting that uh, concept out of of their teaching. And we lost uh, quite a few ministers. Uh, one or two I was working for left in 79, 80. That was particularly traumatic because uh, with the government within the church, you're trying to uh, to maintain government. At the same time, there there were questions at that particular point. And uh, some of them then left. Uh, I would, would say at least with those that I was familiar with, they never got up and, and tried to take the church with them. Uh, so it was a little bit easier maybe perhaps where I was than in other areas where they did try to take the church. So you do have to test what is being said. I, you know, I, I will give you some background in going through some of these things, even in uh, general epistles. I do it in um, homiletics a little bit more than here as far as some of the background, just because I think it's important to know where we came from, what has happened within the church, and particularly as you go out from college, out into church areas, you have a little bit better understanding, particularly for some of those who have been in the church 20, 30 years. And to have the maturity to be able to face up if indeed these similar problems or these uh, problems similar to what's taking place in the past if they come up again. Uh, I hope that they don't. I pray that they don't. 
but I am not naive enough to believe that there won't be somewhere in the world with as large a work as we have not a problem. And then I read Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and he says, except there be a great falling away first. John 10 verse 35, scripture is not broken. John 10 verse 35, scripture is not broken. All that tying in then with the aspect that uh, no scripture is of private interpretation. And this was a problem in the church then, that there were private interpretations of this verse and that verse. And this is how it's going to work out, and they were spreading their little heresies. Does that mean that you're not going to have, from time to time, a certain feeling about a verse that, well, no, I kind of, you know, I see this maybe a little bit different than maybe somebody explains it. The key at that point is to realize if, if it's something that you don't fully understand, to leave it in that realm of, well, I'm still trying to come to understand this fully, which all of us are trying to do with the you know, entirety of the Bible to understand it more fully. But there may be certain sections where there's this little question that's in your mind that you're looking for an answer. Now, it may be another sermon that takes place three or four weeks from now that then gives you an answer to your question. Well, we have to be careful that we don't get caught up with private interpretations that we're trying to hook all these things together and that we're not willing to learn from God and to look see what does the book say. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the word here, moved, is like a ship borne by the wind. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. And as a ship we would say rudderless at that point, that the, the wind drives it where the wind wants it to go. So the Holy Spirit drove the holy men to write what he wanted, uh, what God wanted written. Chapter 2, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there were false prophets, uh, false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the eternal that bought them and bring them bring upon themselves swift destruction. False prophets, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, talks about false prophets and that you are to look to see what they teach, and by that word, then you evaluate whether they are true or false prophets. Also among the people, the people here is ancient Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. And again, you test that, as he said in uh, the two previous verses, against the Word. Denying the Lord, and then surely the Gnostics, and the Jews, because this is Judaic Gnosticism as opposed to uh, other Gnosticism that was extant. Uh, they deny that Christ came in the flesh, and they bring upon themselves swift destruction. Remember what the Jews said, that uh, they would take upon themselves the curse, uh, go ahead and kill Christ, and let, let uh, the curse be upon us and our children. And unfortunately, that's what happened to the Jews. And a part of the uh, destruction through years and years uh, is a result of their rejecting Christ. Christ would fight their battles for them if they hadn't rejected him. And that's a lesson for us to learn. Do we deny Christ? Do we deny him in our life, lifestyles, and what we do, what we say? Because Christ is the only one that can keep us from destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Pernicious means lascivious. It is licensed to sin so that grace may abound. Romans 6, verse 3 or 4 verses. Shall we sin so that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin who have put sin out of our lives, how should we live any longer therein? Many shall follow their pernicious ways. And you might tie in verse 19. While they themselves, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So what you yield yourselves, Romans 6, is that verse 16? Whomsoever you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are. Whether of obedience unto life or of sin unto death, Romans. <coughs> yes, um, 6.16, know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you select whether you're going to be 
a slave in that sense of, of God, a, a bond servant of God, or whether you're going to be a bond servant of Satan. Satan's is a bondage. Christ is a freedom. The service, the slavery to Christ. Back to Second Peter 2, verse 2. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So these false teachers, they come in and the lifestyles and what they, they teach and what they do then uh, makes the way of truth evil spoken of. And through covetousness, so now we see some of the traits of false teachers, covetousness, that they want things for themselves. Shall they with feigned words, feigned words in the Greek means fabricated. Fabricated words are those that are tuned for the ear of the hearer. You say what the hearer wants to hear because they want to live a certain lifestyle, so therefore you make your doctrine to fit their lifestyle. And you pick a verse here and there and make sure that you avoid other verses in the Bible because that then sticks against that lifestyle, but you've been watered down what's taught. And you may just you know, preach from one verse in the Bible rather than getting a full overview and statement about how to live. Their concern was not in bringing people closer to God, their concern was bringing people's money into their pockets and make, making people feel good about themselves. And that's the whole aspect of uh, psychology today. Uh, psychiatry is making people feel guiltless because you tell them, well, you're not guilty because there's no law. And then the people can't figure out why they still feel guilty because of the things that they're doing. Because they are guilty. You can tell someone that they're not guilty if they are guilty. And they're still going to feel guilty until through repentance and through change they resolve that guilt. Verse, uh, continuing verse 3, they have feigned words is for the hearer. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 5 ties in with that. Make merchandise of you. Their gain is monetary. It is for support. They had some ministers that started their own church because they wanted financial support. And some of them got caught up with a scheme that if they established their church, everything they did could be written off. And uh, they did that. And I know one man who used to be a minister in the church who is in prison for five years because he did not pay taxes to the IRS because he tried to get out of it uh, by saying that he was a church and all of his expenses were non-profit. And, and uh, unfortunately, the whole family had to pay because his wife also went to prison for a few months. She went, I think, for about a year he is still in, and we'll be getting out, I think, in a year or two. He's very bitter against the church. Now, he's the one that made the mistakes, but a lot of times we don't then admit that, and then we have to blame someone else. But making merchandise, monetary gain, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. Uh, damnation slumbers not. It means that uh, judgment awaits them with unsleeping eyes. Judgment is not sleeping. And this is what the false teachers want people to believe, that, well, God's not coming back, and he doesn't really care what you do. You just live this life. You do what's, what's valuable to you as an individual growing in it may be musical skills or sports or uh, sexual liberties, whatever you want to do, because there's not going to be any judgment. God is asleep. God's far off. It's a concept of deism, that God created the world, and God exists, but God's gone far off, and he just he created it, and he just left it here. Now you do what you want to do, because he doesn't really care. He doesn't have an involvement in people's lives. That's what they taught, is this concept of, uh, of deism that then became uh, uh, Gnosticism eventually. Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, the word is Tartaru, to a place of restraint, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Satan is in a condition of restraint in that he is restrained to the earth. He is restrained in just how much he can do, how much damage he can do. The Great Tribulation is going to be a time period where God relaxes those restraints. And Satan's natural tendency at that point is going to be to lash out at the church and at Israel. And 
the great tribulation, of course, is Satan's wrath, Satan's anger that will then be unleashed. But at this particular time, there are certain restraints, not total restraint, because this is Satan's world, and uh, he is allowed to govern it. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth, comma, a preacher of righteousness, comma, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah is the eighth from Seth. If you go back to Genesis chapter 5, uh, there are different feelings about this verse. Some have felt that it, Noah was the eighth preacher of righteousness, but we see no statement in the New Testament when you go back to Hebrews chapter 11, they're not all named in there. We see Noah and we see Enoch. So we see two preachers of righteousness that we know were preachers of righteousness. Noah and Enoch. Outside of that, we aren't sure. Uh, so we would see this as a genealogical statement. Noah, the eighth person and preacher of righteousness. We know uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 20 might tie in that Noah preached repentance to the people bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he's making his point here that God is not asleep, that God has brought in destruction, devastation in the past. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live ungodly. So he's warning them that those who think that they could give in to homosexuality and live that lifestyle, quote-unquote lifestyle, as they want to term it, that they are ungodly and that they are going to be damned, that there will be judgment. Now, they can repent, they can change, as we can change for any sin that we commit. Homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin, but it is a sin that must be repented of, that must have an affected change in lifestyle and in commitment so that then that individual can be a part of God's family. Because God's, God wants family members to have a true concept of what a man's role is, what a woman's role is, uh, what proper love is, and how proper love is expressed. So, he says that this is to show those that are ungodly, it should, it should warn us about getting involved with ungodly things. Verse 7, delivered just Lot, not only Lot, but just Lot, righteous Lot, and that he was obeying God, not that he didn't have some areas to grow in, but he was basically uh, following God, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. The word vexed is kataponeo, K-A-T-A-P-O-N-E-O, K-A-T-A-P-O-N-E-O. And it means oppressed by the evil environment. It means worn out. He was worn out. All around him was homosexuality. Perversion of sex. Not that everybody in the city was homosexual, I suppose. Uh, there were others that were uh, heterosexual but perverted and uh, licentious. But the majority were uh, homosexual. They were oppressed by the evil environment. And there are times that you just have to. For instance, an alcoholic has to get away from the environment. Those that have smoking problems, at least in the initial overcoming of the problem, have got to get away from people that smoke. Because when they smell the aroma of smoke, they want to desperately smoke. Now, it doesn't do that for me. That's not one of my temptations, to smoke. I tried it once as a teenager. I think it was two or three drags on a cigarette. It's terrible. And I didn't, I never tried it again. I didn't desire to try it again. But if I had that particular problem, then I would stay out of that environment. Now you have to be careful when you go back to that environment. I've counseled uh, college students who went back to the environment and smoking was their difficulty before they came and they still had a difficulty when they went back. Now, with the understanding and, and God's word and God's spirit, they were over, able to overcome it and, and to stay away from it. But don't think that then the temptations won't come back again. That's with a filthy conversation, that means conduct, of which conversation is an aspect of conduct. Of the wicked, wicked means lawless. 
those people who view that uh, they can live life free without principles. Free to live without principles. Verse 8, For that righteous man, dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed, and this is a different Greek word, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Vexed here is basanitso, B-A-S-A-N, I-Z-O. B-A-S-A-N-I-Z-O. It means to torture, to be put in pain, to toil, or to be tested in order to prove something. We are vexed, maybe by health difficulties, it may be by family that don't like the situation we're in. Uh, we can remove ourselves from an evil environment, as in the environment of Sodom, and there are certain environments we ought to stay totally away from. But then we can also be vexed by day-to-day -day living, and that we need to look at as the proof of faith in us. Are we being proven, just like you prove horses as to whether they're going to uh, be able to you know, run races if it's thoroughbreds, or you prove them to the plow, whether they can, you know, oxen can pull plows or not and whether they're going to pull their weight. So, the Christian will be vexed by trying to live righteously among the unlawful. So, in the environment, an overall environment of sin, you're also going to be vexed. You're going to be tried by trying to live righteously in spite of the fact that everyone around you at work may be cursing. And you may think in order to fit in and to be liked by the guys that you need to curse too, or to smoke, or, and let's take something now that we know is okay with intemperance, and that's drinking. Alcohol, okay, you know, we, we know, well, we shouldn't curse, we know we shouldn't smoke. You know, alcohol's all right. So, therefore, if you're on the job with someone, and they, you know, they want to take a break, and, and they have beer, and I know they're construction workers, you know, and they're sweating tons of sweat during the day, and if they have a beer mid-afternoon, I don't think that's a problem. On campus, it's a problem, okay? <laughs> Must cover myself. But if you're on a job somewhere, but then if you think you're going to keep up with them, as I know what happens sometimes uh, with construction workers, I'm not against construction workers, by the way, uh, that they go and then they'll pick up a case. Now, if you think you're going to uh, drink a six-pack or two with them and whatever, and you're going to maintain your moral standards and you're going to be temperate, then uh, you better do some rethinking. But you're going to have to live in an ungodly society and to maintain godly conduct. And it is vexing. It is difficult. Don't undersell it. Don't expect for everything to be peaches and cream and everything's just going to be great. You get out of college and go back to a church area and, and you get a job. That's when you really start applying what you've learned. And I think you ought to have joyful lives and I think things ought to be great in that aspect and that you do have. The ability to live as a lamp in darkness, to be a light to other people. And you have that strength. You have that confidence that comes in obeying God. But there are going to be others that then give you a difficult time about it. There may be some lost jobs as a result of that. There may be some lost relationships with employers or others who want you to do the same things they're doing because, you know, somehow when you're doing things that are wrong, if everybody else does it without complaint, then uh, it makes you uh, feel less guilty or you think it makes you feel less guilty. Verse 9, The Eternal knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. God will deliver you as he delivered Lot, if you turn to God, if you're on your knees day in and day out, if you want to live godly. But you've got to want to do it. God knows how to deliver you, and he will deliver you. But it takes an awful lot of work on your part, too, that you are submitting yourself to God and his way of life. And to reserve. So, on contrast, he'll deliver you, but he also knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now we're going to see, I think there are 17 attributes of false teachers and of the ungodly. Being unjust. Living an unrighteous life is number one. Let's just read through verse, verse 10 and we'll just point them out. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust. So, second point we see is the lust of uncleanness. We live in the lust of uncleanness. I'd tie in verse 4 of chapter 1. 
where it talked about the corruption that is in the world through lust. They despise government. Point number three. Do you despise government? Be it government within the dorms, government within uh, student services and faculty, uh, within the church, because if you despise it now, I guarantee you when you get out of here and you're going to be under more government in uh, different situations perhaps, in work and whatever, you're going to have problems. They despise government. Um, government means authority. Despise authority over them. They are presumptuous, point number four, presuming more power, more authority to themselves than has been given. That can be a tremendous problem, particularly if you do get to be used for sermonettes. If you do get to be used then as a deacon, eventually as a local elder, a deacon's wife or a minister's wife, or whatever responsibilities, uh, working with cheerleading, whatever you get to do in a church area, be careful that you don't become presumptuous because now you have a little bit of authority that you're going to take a lot of authority. And then you, all of a sudden you're going to lord it over parents and you're going to, you know, you see this kid's got child rearing problems, you know, and it's got to be the parents' fault. So therefore you're going to talk to the parents, but they're not doing this and that. And you can tell because you're sure getting coach. A bit presumptuous. Now, if there is something related to cheerleading that they do wrong and you have to go to the parents and say, look, this happened and, you know, if I can be of any help, I'd be glad to, but, you know, this happened and, and it's a problem within cheerleading. Now, you have to talk with the pastor, too, even in those situations. I would go to the pastor first so he's aware that there's a problem and then he may want you to go to the parent. He may want to take care of himself because he, after all, is the overseer of the church. He may have already been working with those parents and this is another aspect that, well, he can take care of it and he can really see Believe it or not, and I think you believe it, I don't mean that sarcastically, but he can see that there are some situations that you do want to address the situation like that. There are others, and maybe other family problems are having that, okay, he'll address it, but he would rather take care of some other things first, and that's not a major thing. To you, it may be a major thing, because you're working with cheerleading and this thing, this major thing. Sometimes kids work things out among themselves. And it doesn't mean made a major thing. But we have to be careful that we're not presumptuous as far as when we're given authority that then we're going to lord it over people or we're going to then get involved in things that is presuming that we have any business being involved in it. You know, New Testament concept is be careful that lest we become gossips and busybodies and involved. Now, it doesn't mean that if there's some sin involved and, you know, if you're head cheerleader, then cheerleaders are all going out drinking six-packs. Uh, you know, before the games, that you don't have something, you better do something about it, okay? You do have, that's not presumptuous. You've got that responsibility. All these evil cheerleaders. <laughs> presumptuous are they self-willed. So the ungodly are self-willed. Boy, they are so determined they're going to do it this way. And that their way is the right way. And who are you to tell me any differently? That's something we all have to think about wherever we are in the chain of command. How self-willed are we? Are we after the will of God the Father? Service-willed in that sense, uh, other-willed, as opposed to self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Uh, as far as being presumptuous, you might tie in Saul, how insolent he was. He presumed to take upon himself the right to sacrifice. God had given that to the, to the uh, priests, to the Levites. It was not Saul's responsibility. Speaking evil of dignitaries, it's one way that people reduce leaders to nothing by exposing them. And we see that, you know, look what's happened even within the uh, political races. Now, I think Hart kind of asked for what he got in some ways because he told them, well, if you think I've got the womanizing problems, then just follow me and see. And they did. I mean, I... <laughs> For the life of me, I guess he figured if he said that, they believed that he didn't have any problems, so therefore he could do what he wanted to do. I, I don't know, but, but uh, that was a difficulty that uh, he, he kind of set up. But particularly within the church, uh, we may become aware of problems that individuals have. Do you speak evil? Do you speak about the evil and, and the mistakes they made? Is that something that then you identify them 
and that you talk about, well, they've got this problem, that problem, so that somehow you have the right not to do what they say because they happen to be an authority. And, and that's something that you have to give thought to. Is that clock right? Okay, we will... Uh, We'll pick up the papers, if we can have a couple of, either door. we'll pick up the papers on the way out. We will finish up Second Peter then on Thursday and uh, get perhaps a background of John. That will give us probably about three classes for John and uh, then uh, one class then for Second, Third John and Jude. Jude, we will see that, uh, in fact, if you will, between class, between now and Thursday, read Jude with this, and I'll probably tie a little bit of Jude into Second Peter chapter 2, because they are so similar that I think we can basically handle some of the, uh, the context of both at that time to save us time at the other end. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.